の鼓動が消えかかるそれダッシュオレンジャー熱い血流れる鋼の Oh, Dave, actually, before we start, I just had a fun idea where、mm. I will do the intro and then I will say that I'm Matt and then I'll also say that I'm Dave and I'll do it for a second and then you can interrupt me. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to the Super Sentai Brothers. This is episode 35 of For Your Eyes, O Ranger, the internet's best and only podcast dedicated to Cherokee Sentai O Ranger. Every week we watch an episode of the show and we share our thoughts with you, the listeners. My name is Matt Jane, with me as always is my co host and brother Dave. Dave, how are you doing today?、Uh, yeah, Matt. Hey, I'm,、uh, it's, I'm good. Good. How are you doing today? Hey, Matt. Matt, let me break in here. Oh,、uh, hey, Dave. Hey.、Welcome、I am.、Back. Yeah, well, like I said, I am good.、Um, I, don't, I don't know what you mean. I never went anywhere.、Um, <laughs> this、uh, is a show that we do together, both of us. So. Yes. Well, like I said, as with me, as always. My、yeah. co host and brother Dave. Yeah. Dave, I am glad that you're doing well, well、uh, today. Yeah,、uh, yeah, no, I am. The weather has finally broken. Oh my gosh. It's so nice out. Grandma, of course, is freezing now. Well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you can't please everyone. <laughs> the other day, it was like 85, and she, was, she has like long, you know, like long pants and a shirt on. Like, obviously, she's dressed.、Um, she was like, Dave, is it a little, is it a little cold? I was like, Grandma, it. Like, I'll get you your jacket if you want, but it, it really isn't. It's like 85 degrees here. But she spends a lot of time in California. And also, she's、yeah. 96. So, sure. It's hard, to, it's hard to regulate at that point. Yeah.、Um, anyway, Dave,、um, speaking of things that are difficult to regulate, today we're watching episode 35 of Cherokee Sentai O Ranger called The Violently Explosive Jerk. Oh, yeah. I'm excited.、Uh, it is going to be good. But of course, Dave, before we get into that, As always, shining in the heavens, there are five stars. And would you like to talk about our first star of the week? Yeah, so our first star of the week is、uh, so last week, I just, there were a couple of, I sort of misspoke. There were a couple of clarifications that I wanted to offer about one or two of the stars. Okay.、Um, the first thing that I, that I mentioned about the Dick Van Dyke show really was exactly what I kind of meant to say amazingly is that. It's, ju- it's a really good show, and you forget how to say. I sometimes forget that old things are also very, very good. Oftentimes, it's easy not- to do. Okay. Like in the realm of, say, like literature, like I actually like old literature, generally speaking, much more than I like new literature. So, like, that makes sense to me. But, like, TV, just like, yeah, well, they had TV in the 60s, but, like, it was all lame, right? No, it wasn't. Dick Van Dyke is very, very funny. Yeah, especially comedy, because in many ways, a lot of comedy is like very generational, right? Like some things that are funny to one person are not funny to their kids or their parents. Right.、Um, but there are certain things, like the Dick Van Dyke show,、um, that honestly do hold up very well, however many years later. Yeah,、um, Mary Tyler Moore show, the exact same way. Grandma's getting a little tired of Dick Van Dyke, but she yeah, really yeah. likes Mary Tyler Moore. Also,、uh, here's, here's my hot tip from the last time Grandma was staying with me dip into some new heart. Oh, yeah. I will check that out. Here's a funny thing that I sort of I never noticed, that, but that Beth has noticed from an outsider's perspective. Because Beth、mm-hmm. never watched Mary Tyler Moore, apparently. Oh, really? Yeah. I just, you know, who knows? But you know, who does、really、like, yeah,、uh, you know who does really like Mary Tyler Moore? I mean, like a lot of people, but our mom. Mom really likes Mary Tyler Moore.、Mm-hmm. And Beth said, She,、uh, she was like, you know, I've been watching Mary Tyler Moore and I, having never seen it before, I did not realize how many of mom's little mannerisms are derived probably from like being a big fan of the Mary Tyler Moore show. Like, there's a lot of things that Mary Tyler Moore does that mom kind of also does. Oh, yeah? Like, not, yeah, like, not precisely. And it would be hard to explain unless, like, you just spent a lot of time with our mother and also watched the Mary Tyler Moore show. But if you do both of those things, like, watch the Mary Tyler Moore and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's actually pretty funny. All right. Well, I guess I, I wonder if I should also then go back and rewatch that girl. 
uh, mom's Maybe other favorite sh- show. Dude, mom I, loves that show. <laughs> which I refuse to watch, mom. I, I, you know, I love you dearly. I, dude, I watched I like one episode of it. And I did not like it. Oh, here's the other thing that I did. Uh, I, t- speaking of Baby Watch, last week's Baby Watch. <laughs> We interrupt your regular broadcast of the Super Sentai Brothers to bring you a breaking news update. Baby Watch. Here's the thing that I forgot to say when I was talking about it because I was so tired because the babies don't sleep. Here's a wild new development. Uh, Buddy Bear has learned how to frame his sister. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Beth watched this happen. He bit himself because she tends to like, he snatches toys from her, but she bites. Okay. He bit himself hard enough to leave teeth marks. Beth watched him do this and then walked over saying, bite, bite, like showing his arm. And she said, did Sugar Bean bite you? And he was like, yeah, bite. But like she, he didn't or she didn't. He bit himself <laughs> and blamed her for it. It was incredible. Wow. Wickedness. Wickedness <laughs> lives in the heart of these children. Uh, and all children, Dave. And all children <laughs> and all people. We're all terrible. Uh, anyways. Any any more follow-up you want to do uh, talking about last week's episode? Anything no, you forgot to mention? Not really. I just felt like it was a good episode, man. I mean, I don't want to like pat ourselves on the back too hard here, but I feel like we crushed it. It was a hey, really, we, really good episode. We do good work here on this show. Dave. It was a good episode of our show. <laughs> it was also a pretty fantastic episode of O Ranger. Like, I just did not like. I kind of can't get over. I know we talked about it last week. About we just said like, man, wouldn't it be crazy if if Bacchus Wrath just died and then he did? <laughs> yeah. Now, not only is that weird for the show, it all it does also kind of make me now feel like I have a strange power. Uh, <laughs> you got to be careful what you say. Yeah. Got the bard's tongue, man. Um, anyway, Dave, uh, what is our second star of the week? Oh, it's not a huge deal, but it is something I'm kind of excited about that I wanted to chat for a few minutes about. Um, in college, I did a lot of weightlifting. Like a yeah. lot. Yeah. Um, and it's something that, like, I really like it. It's kind of, like, if I'm going to exercise, which I really need to do more of, weightlifting is my kind of preferred, like, I just like to lift weights. Um, but I don't really have the time, nor do I own a bunch of weights. Um, and I don't have, like, anyways, I just don't do a whole lot of weightlifting anymore. But what I do have is a set of Captains of Crush grip strength trainers that I got, like, ages ago. Oh, I remember when you got those. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the deal. You know, like a grip strength trainer is like your grandfather probably had one if he was interested in like calisthenics or something. It's just like it's a little squeezy handle with like a coil of metal at the top and you just you squeeze it. That's a grip strength trainer. Yeah. Well, Captains of Crush make like the world's craziest grip strength trainers. Okay. Like I'm a... Like, I don't want to oversell this, but like I said, like I lifted a lot of weights in college. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big ish guy. Like, let me say it that way. Um, and I have the trainer. I'm not, they make a one through a four. Right. And then Mm -hmm. they go, they went down after a while. People were like, could you make one that's like less intense than the one? And that's what I have. I have the trainer. Like it's the version that you buy. If someday you want to be able to use these things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so the trainer, but even the trainer is a hundred pound clothes, is what they say. Wow. Um, yeah, like that's how much force you have to be able to exert on it. Um, and I finally, like, I've done enough work with it that I'm finally ready to order. I think, Matt, I think I'm finally ready to order the number one. Now, what, to, what is the what is the crush strength on the number the one? The crush strength of the number one is 140 pounds. Okay. Uh, but they now, say I, if, I if don't you know can if... do 25 closes with the with one, you're kind of ready to move up to the next. Like, you you can probably get it and you'll be good. Okay. Now, I don't know the next time you're going to be able to bring this up because... We, probably never. Because we have been doing this show now for almost four years. Um... And I'm pretty sure that 
you bought that trainer so long ago that it has never been a star. I did, but I haven't been like, I sort of, I had lost it actually. And I sort of, I, I refound it recently and I've been kind of like working back up with that. Okay. Over the so course it's not of, like, like you couple, have, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is it's not, not like this thing. has been five years coming. Right. But yeah, but listen, do not expect another update on this for a long time. Like I said, these things go from one to four, right? Mm-hmm. You know how many people have, they keep track of how many people can close these things because it's not a large number. There have been a grand total of five people who have ever closed <laughs> a number four captains of Cro- five, five people. Uh, and one of them is Magnus Samuelson. If you are in like, if you know who that is. Um, and he did it in 2004 or something, 2004, 2008. It's been like upwards of a decade since anybody has closed a number four captains of crush gripper, but I do am they- moving up and do they make them or do they like make them on demand? Because there can't be any like real profit in selling something that only four people have ever been able to use. Well, you know, I think you probably like they sell a lot of people. I think they, my guess is that most of them that get sold get sold. It's like a very aspirational, like you get it. And then, you know, maybe like someday you'll, you'll be able to close it. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not. Don't expect an update on this one. Any. Anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> what, Matt, is our third star of the week? Dave, our third star of the week is that the other day I was driving home from, uh, I was just driving home and I, I, I stopped that sentence because I don't remember where I was coming home from. Um, but the Work th- or the ABC. Those are my guesses. I mean, those are really the two options. Um, and as I was getting home, like it started to rain. I thought, oh, okay, like, like it's it raining. Does. You know, we actually had a lot of rain recently in Cleveland, yeah. which is nice because it's been super dry all summer. Yeah. Now here is uh, here is something that you, the listener, may or may not know about um, where I live. Not only do we live in Cleveland, which is sort of like generally close to the lake. Yeah. My my apartment is very close to the lake. It like as the crow flies, it's maybe an eighth of a mile. Yeah, it's like, it's... It's like, you're like two blocks up. Exactly. Like, I have to sort of like get to the end of the street to get a clear view of the lake, but I can like get from my apartment to a place where I can look at Lake Erie in about eight minutes of walking. Um, And that includes putting my shoes on. So, what that (laughs) means is that sometimes, like, when the rain hits, it really hits because that like just off the lake weather is crazy sometimes. Yeah, it gets pretty well. Although actually it was it was pretty nuts by us. Like Beth was actually coming home at the same ish time from something else, and I only remember because like you both texted me at around the same time, and she's like, I pulled off the road because this is not safe to drive in. Yeah, like I was I was driving home and it was coming down so hard and so quickly that I needed to like make some real-time judgments as to, like, okay, can I still take this path home? Because the road might be flooded out. But, like, you... it started raining while I was in the car, and I was, like, five minutes away from home, and the roads were already flooding. You know, this is something, like, because of where we, like, Cleveland, you know, we don't really have, we don't have, like, earthquakes or tornadoes or, like, wildfires or anything. Like, yeah. none of, like, the really major natural events hit us every once in a while we get like some really really nasty snow but but that's kind of about it and so we are i I feel like you know in many ways removed from like the ever-present all power of nature oh yeah you know what i mean like if you live in san francisco i which i think is prone to earthquakes you're just like yeah man Earthquakes, that's the thing that happens, and maybe it'll be the big one, and it'll destroy, I don't know, the whole state. And that's just, like, something that's in your head. But in Cleveland, that's not really a concern. Like, it's just not a thing here. Uh, And so I am always struck when you hit some... Like, when something natural happens, and you just have to stop. Like, like, yeah, you were driving. You're not driving anymore. Because it's, ra- it's raining too hard. Yeah, like you had to change your plans because it was wet. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm sitting in my car. I've, I had to park like two blocks away from my apartment uh, because it was like there was just nowhere to park. Um, and I have street parking at my place. 
So I have my laptop with me from work, and I don't want to, like, leave it in the car overnight, but the problem is it's raining super hard, and so I have to, like, I've got it in my bag, and I also have to find room in that bag to put my shoes in there, because I've it's raining to the point where I, like, I know I can't just stay in my car and wait it out. I know that if I get out of the car while wearing my shoes, they will just be, like, soaked and ruined for a week. Yeah. So I have to, like, take off my shoes, shove them in, like, my sort of zip-up briefcase, like, try to not crush my computer, hop out of the car, and just run, like, two blocks to get to my apartment. By the time I get there, I am, like, like, to the bone soaked, right? Right. Um, and I get to, and I get inside, and I put my stuff down, like, you know, the, I've managed to keep the computer dry. It's the only, like, the computer and the shoes are okay. Everything else is, like, just drenched. And, but I realized as I was getting out of my car a few minutes before that, that the spot I was parked in was only mostly a parking spot. Like, it was kind of, like, right near the edge of where the parking zone ended. Oh, no. Like, at the end of a block. And so I was like, I have to go back out and look at this again just to make sure that I'm not going to get a ticket by the morning. But, like... It's still, like, really just coming down, like, in just in rivers. So I decided that, like, the only real way to approach this situation was to just, like, act as though I was going to the pool and just, like, throw on my swim trunks and walk down the street. And, like, (laughs) once I was just, like, walking down the street in my trunks, it was actually very nice. I was in no particular rush. Uh, you know, he didn't have to worry about the sidewalk being dirty because anything that was on that had just gotten washed away. Um, so I was just like barefoot in swim trunks walking down the street at night. You know, yeah, I had to go see, check out, make sure the car was okay, then just turn around and walk back. See, that's the thing about rain. It's not that I mind being out in the rain. I just don't like being... Like, I don't like it if I have to be dry somewhere else later. Yeah. Like, I will walk through the rain, rain and get wet if I am heading to my house. That's fine, because I'll just put on new clothes. Like, if I have to be somewhere afterwards, then I hate it. Uh, What, Matt, is our... Man, we spent a long time talking about the rain. Uh, What, Matt, is our fourth (laughs) star of the week? Dave, fourth star of the week is that um, yesterday I had to go to the dentist. I think we've been... uh, Yeah, we talked about that. updates earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And I got some fillings. Crushing of your own mortality, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got some fillings, um, and I was a very good boy at the dentist. Um, and Dave, it, it is a truth universally acknowledged that when a boy is very good at the dentist, uh, he, he must be in want of a treat. Yeah. Did you pull it out of like a giant plastic strawberry? Uh, no, that is that, uh, uh, dear listeners, that is what our childhood dentist, uh, used to have available to us. A big hollow plastic strawberry full of treats. Um, no, I instead went to Target and I bought myself an NES classic. Nice, that's much better. <laughs> because also, like, now that I am 34, the treat that I get myself after going to the dentist uh, can be a little nicer than just, like, a little wind-up toy. Mm. Um, and dude, the NES Classic is wild because it feels exactly like an NES. And listen, like, I know this thing came out a year ago and other people have had them, and I'm not breaking any new ground here, but it's the first time I've used it. And, like, the controller is just a Nintendo controller. Like, Exactly. Here is the one thing I would have hoped, and I bet they didn't do it. Did they make it extra large? No, no, it is just the exact same size. See, they should have made it extra large to accommodate the growth in my hands. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'll tell you, I was playing it all yesterday. So that and, it was like relatively the same size? Um, uh, the, the controller size is not actually a problem. I, I thought that it might have been, and then I picked it up. I was like, oh, this is like, this feels right. Like, it feels exactly right. It feels sort of unnervingly right, you know? You know, uh, producer Mark mentioned something very, very similar about playing uh, Mega Man 2. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was just playing Mega Man 2 last night. I mean, obviously, I was playing all these games. Right, yeah. The the good news is that all of these games really hold up super well. Like, Mega Man 2 still rules. All the the Mario games are great. Uh, The first two Zelda games are very good. The bad news is that I am no better at them than I was the last time I played them. Dude, the the old video games are hard. Like, I'm not worse at them. But I I, I went to go play Punch-Out. And traditionally speaking, here has been my experience playing Punch-Out. I beat everyone in the first round... 
Except maybe it takes two rounds to beat um uh uh what's what's the teleporting guy? Something tiger. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it takes two rounds for him just based on timing, and then I get to Bald Bull, and I cannot beat Bald Bull. Like, and then I have to go back and like fight other people again, and then I get back up to Bald Bull, and Bald Bull beats me, and then it is game over. Like that has always been my experience playing Punch Out, and that is exactly what happened last night. And it was kind <laughs> of upsetting because I really hoped that I was gonna like put it together a little more, um, but no. Uh, so I have not lost any ground, Dave, but uh, it is still, Punch-Out! is still a brutal game sometimes. <laughs> uh, that's kind of it. Uh, the NES Classic is great. I'm not going to like go beat by beat through the games internet, um, but if, uh, if you have the chance, play one. The Nintendo games are very good. Dave, what is our fifth Star of the Week? So our fifth Star of the Week, uh, speaking of old things, Matt, we've mentioned before that we have a subscription to uh, Marvel Unlimited, and the entire Onslaught saga just got added. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I saw this. Well, sort of. It's... Wait, man. sort of it's sort of added or it's sort of... No, no, no. Oh, it's yeah. definitely added, but it's only sort of like an oh, yeah. Like, it's very much... Well, okay. I... I maybe am not giving it quite enough credit because I do wrap up Onslaught with Heroes Reborn. And Heroes Reborn was a travesty. Like, it was terrible. Um, sorry, Onslaught is a, it was a big Marvel Comics event from like 1996, 97, something somewhere in there? like that. Late 90s. Yeah. And uh, like Professor X merges with Magneto, kind of, sort of. It's, well, it's okay. weird. Well, Professor X doesn't merge with Magneto during Fatal, at the end of Fatal Attractions. Yeah, when... no, man, I know. Okay. I just did, I just did not feel like. <laughs> did go not feel like going deep Magneto. into Fatal Attractions. <laughs> um, <laughs> Here is, okay, here's the thing I remember from Onslaught. I I remember it's when the Invisible Woman started wearing, like it was right around that area, era where she started wearing her stripper costume. Uh, that ended up being a thing where she had been um, possessed by malice. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And the second thing I really remember from Onslaught is, so it's after, uh, this is when like Wolverine is in his like savage Wolverine stage right he's lost all the adamantium and he's becoming sort of like more animalistic right? well if you recall dave in wolverine issue 100 he had tried to have the adamantium or uh i think nemesis tried to put the adamantium back into wolverine but wolverine like rejected it and it made his body kind of explode and that's when he went into the no nose like ragged bandana version of feral wolverine yeah so the thing that i remember from onslaught is that no like, one cares about these details but me i don't know why i keep interrupting you so anyways here's the thing the the other big thing that i remember is that somebody shows up and says like x-men what's happening with onslaught and professor professor x because this is from the period of time where where everybody was like professor x is great and has forgotten that he's kind of sort of a creep a little bit yeah. Like, and, kind of, and always has been since, like, issue two, when he's, like, slightly perving on Jean Grey. Yeah, there um, are there are times in X-Men where Professor X is better or worse. And this was actually coming out of a time in, like, the early to mid-90s when Professor X was sort of more idealized. Yeah, so anyways, uh, the, they show up and they're like, what's going on with Professor X? And Wolverine launches into a, like, multi-paragraph... Like, the other X-Men are there. X-Men, who would be far better suited for the voice of the narrator as expositor, and he launches into, like, a six-paragraph exposition of, like, the history of Onslaught. And it is very clearly, like, it should just be in a sidebar, but they had Wolverine say it, and so they felt, like, a passing need to put it into Wolverine's voice... Well, but, like, also... it's not how Wolverine talks at all. It's like, and that's when the good man that was Charles Xavier became corrupted in his deepest heart by... <laughs> and it's just like, that's... Why would you put those words in Wolverine's mouth? Just have, like, Storm say it or something. It would make so much more sense. Well, uh, it, especially is... because at the time that Onslaught was coming out, there was a big thing in Marvel Comics that every character had, like, a custom word balloon... Oh, yeah, custom, well, and font. That was also a big part of it. Yeah, so if I'm remembering correctly, and I might be, I might not be remembering correctly, but I seem to recall that this all happened 
in Wolverine's like custom sort of like scratchy craggy font. Yeah, it totally did. It's amazing. Uh anyway, but, I mean, and listen, parts of parts of Onslaught ruled. You yeah, got Oz- you got Ozymandias coming in. I do love Ozymandias. He's very very good. I went back and read The Rise of Apocalypse, which I forgot took place as long as it I mean like in when it was published as long ago as it did. That was wild. Oh yeah, man. Uh anyway, yeah, it's oh boy, I'm I'm flipping through it right now. Got some good X got some good Nate Gray, the X Man stuff. Man, I forgot about that dude. Whatever happened to that guy? Okay, we're not here to talk about Onslaught. I mean we are a little bit, but that's not mostly what we're here for. Okay, okay. No, I'm putting this down because otherwise uh man, Joe Dr- Joe Joe Madriero drew that issue. I love that era. Anyway, sorry. Love Joe Mad. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, uh, check out Onslaught, maybe. It's a cool, weird snapshot of, like, that era of X-Men, if, if nothing else. Got the Dark Beast. Matt, move on. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so we are moving on. We're moving on to episode 35, then, of Cherokee Sentai Ranger. It is called The Violently Explosive Jerk, and we will be right back. <laughs> Okay, we are back. We have just finished watching episode 35 of Cherokee Sentai O-Ranger, the violently explosive jerk. It was written by... Uh, I, I wrote this down the first time we started doing it, and it's been the same guy every episode. Uh, uh, Hirohisa <laughs> Soda. Um, and, in case you have forgotten, you can watch along with these uh, at Shout Factory TV, um, which, in this case, I would recommend... This oh yeah, is this is a cool, weird episode. <laughs> this is a very, very good episode. Uh, Dave, you want to get us started? Yeah, sure. So we end up. Well, we start off our episode in um in on the moon in Baranoia, and uh, Prince Bulldont is super angry. So for which I he's dead, is dead. So we do find out, and I guess I had never put this together before, despite the fact that it's very obvious. Some emotions clearly are okay in Baranoia, just not the nice ones. Yeah. Um, oh, Matt, I don't know if I've ever no- mentioned this to you. Uh, I do, but I am tickled by it, even though it's a thing that I do. When I type bull don't into my notes, it is B-U-L-D-O-N apostrophe T. Like, don't do that. Bull don't. <laughs> like, please, I don't, I, please don't be the way that you are. <laughs> please don't be the way that you are, because I hate him so much. Anyways, um, this actually, now well, having this, said that. This must have been a great episode for you. <laughs> having said that, this is Prince Bull don'ts best moment ever. He's so angry, he just says, I'm just going to fire every missile we have at Earth. Which, first of all, has that been an option the whole time? I mean, I I guess it was, but there's a few problems with this plan. The first of all is that he doesn't launch every missile. He's left at least one. We will talk about it in a minute. And the second is that his ultimate plan of launching every missile they have at Earth lasts for exactly 30 seconds. Yeah, well, the big big problem just flies into space and lasers them all. Yeah, the problem with this plan is that it doesn't work. But the fact that they never tried it was a little unusual to me. Like, they have missile batteries. They're there. Uh, So, anyways, there is, uh, yeah, so there's an alert at the bait, as Matt said, like, the Rangers take care of these missiles in like less than 30 seconds. There's an alert at the base. They run in, they're like, there's all these missiles. And the chief says, we have to fight back. And they make it a really dramatic moment. Like they zero in on the chief's face and he like makes this pronouncement. We have to fight back. Yeah, dude. Yeah, you have to fight back. But that's not a presage to like some larger thing. They just launch the robo blockers or the, oh, the block blocker robos. They launch the blocker robos. And then they blow up the missiles. Yeah, and then even, that's it. I don't even think they launch them separately. I think they launch O Blocker as like one big thing. Oh, like, yeah. We don't even get also, a transformation combination sequence here. They just like fire O Blocker out of a cannon. He shoots a laser out of his face and he blows up all the missiles in one shot. That and listen, also leads me to it's ask. It's very good. How large is that cannon? Because they fire all of the Blocker Robos out of it. And then they, well, I guess. O blocker is about the same size as the blocker robos. Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly how that works because it doesn't make any sense. But it is true. no, it doesn't. Yeah, it very much doesn't make sense. Um, it kind of bothered me actually. Anyways, hey man, because these, it's these you know because we energy had this... to fold those things into extra dimensional space. 
Cool. I'm good. Why That's not? That's all I needed. Hey, we I, well, hey, I was going to say, because they did the same thing in Conquer Ranger, but Conquer Ranger is magic, so, like, whatever. Yeah, but we do know that um, Ricky, the King Ranger, definitely used Cherokee energy to, like, move in and out of, like, a weird dimension, right? That's how, where he was for the last however many millions of years. Uh, six million, I believe. But, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's hey. all. Like I said, I'm perfectly happy with that explanation. Cho He's, Ricky to fold it into extra dimensional space. I'm good. Hey, Dave, remember Ricky? It's been yeah, a vaguely. few episodes. Yeah, vaguely. around in a minute. I really thought, like, because they made, like, Doran and the Pyramid and everything, I thought he was going to kind of continue to be a larger portion of the series. It's, I'm kind of bummed out that he's not, because Ricky is super rad. Yeah. We miss Ricky. Miss you every day. Uh, anyways, so that plan doesn't work on Bulldown's end. And then Bulldog is throwing a tantrum because he is a robo child, dog, a robo dog child. Anyways, that's not me making fun of him. He just has a dog's face. Yeah. Anyways, uh, and then a missile launches literally like into the throne room. Yes. Like it just kind of, there's like an open window, which you could do on the moon because they're all robots. So they don't right, need to breathe or anything. Yeah, they're fine. Except they do talk. Maybe whenever they talk, it's like robot. It's like radio transmissions or something. There's just no oxygen there. Anyways, so it's a missile robot. Yes. So when it lands, it's a missile and it blows up. But like, it doesn't. The missile is not destroyed in the explosion. It just yeah. Hits it and releases it, an explosive blast. It itself does not explode. Yeah, and then it flips around upside down. And like arms and legs and a head pop out of it, and we yep. and we meet Bomber the Great. Okay, so first of all, Bomber the Great rules. Uh huh. Uh, he is just yeah. He he's got a great look. He's got sort of like a vague fighter pilot vibe going on, except that he just how to sit like his arms and legs are both just very human sized and almost human looking like. He's just like a dude wearing a missile is is kind of how he looks. Yeah, he's um, got like some medals on his chest. One of the medals is like the the sort of thing that would be painted on a World War II like, bomber, like a pretty yeah, lady. Yeah, like a pinup girl nose art thing. Yeah, but like sitting on top of a missile, like that is just a gold badge on his chest. Yeah, so the next thing about uh, Missler the Bomber, Bomber the Great... The next thing about Bomber the Great is that he has two faces because he has, like, his head popping out of the missile has a face, but then the, his missile body also has a face so that he can scowl at you while he's in his missile form flying around. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's amazing. And then the next amazing thing that he does... So at first it seems... He's, like, walking around, and Hysteria clearly knows this dude. Yeah. Like, my vibe... Like the vibe that I got from it is that she he was like Hysteria's old boyfriend who has shown up again and she's very uncomfortable about it. Yeah, it doesn't turn out to be the case, but like that's sort of the interaction that you that we're seeing between these two. Yeah, especially because Hysteria, Hysteria recognizes Bomber the Great, but Bulldone doesn't. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's maybe what led me to feel like it was maybe an old boyfriend or something. Mm-hmm. And then Bomber the Great does something amazing uh he just straps bulldog to a missile right so bulldog said we're going to fire every missile unfortunately he has left one missile <laughs> and yeah. that really is <laughs> not going his way <laughs> Bummer the great shit shows up he doesn't really offer an explanation aside from just like nah i'm getting rid of this dude and he just straps this child dog robot to a missile and just launches him at earth yeah so on Earth, the O-Rangers look up and they're like, oh man, here comes another missile. So they just fly back up in O-Blocker and cut the missile in half. And so the half with Bulldog on it just kind of falls away. And then the, the front half, the missile half, continues to, to fly forward. And it flies forward and then somehow achieves an angle that is like roughly parallel to the ground Mm -hmm. and then it flies in the front window of a car yeah and then just sort of stops there so a missile has been launched from space has crashed from from the moon yeah has crashed through the windshield of this van yeah does it it make it through the back seat 
No, it gets like, about the halfway through. Is... Uh, three of the four people in the van, the mother, the father, and the brother, or the son, you know. Um, son, brother, yeah. All get out. There is a little girl. And are fine. Totally fine. They're a little freaked out. Um... But the daughter is also mostly fine, but her leg is sort of trapped under the warhead, the unexploded Which, warhead. Okay, yeah. Her leg is like sideways across the seat. But she wasn't like, the only way that could have happened is if her leg was sitting, if she was doing that already. Well, you know, Dave, that's a good But she that's very definitely lesson. wasn't. Everyone, you, you know, when you sit in the car, sit properly, because otherwise you might get a missile lodged against your leg. But, right, but we saw her in the car. She wasn't sitting that way. Maybe, maybe I, she got jostled when a missile came through the windshield. I don't know. Okay, so anyways, uh, so this little girl, her name is Rumi. She's trapped under the missile. The rangers arrive, and uh, they, they're they like, they are holding the parents and the brother back from the car. They're like, listen, like I know that your daughter's in there. You You can't go in there. This missile might explode at any second. Like, we need to keep you safe. Right. So, Momo will go in. So somehow, falling from space and crashing through a car has not caused this thing to explode. But shifting it slightly to get this girl out of the car will certainly cause it to go off. Yeah. Well, then also, so Momo opens up the missile and she says something about, like, the chemical process has started to explode this missile and there's a countdown timer and she says it's going to explode in an hour. This is the worst missile. Yeah, it's a very bad missile. <laughs> like, why would you put a time bomb? Why is there a... Because the episode demands it. But outside of that, why would a missile have a time bomb on it? Man, I don't I, listen. I mean, and then also, this timer is set for an hour. And let me tell you, this episode is not a cliffhanger. Now, actually, I do kind of dig this. Like, I goofed on it a second ago, but I kind of dig this because I think we've mentioned before that it seems like, you know, like much more time has to be passing than we are seeing in these episodes. Particularly yeah. when, you know, like robots are showing up and, and all of this stuff is happening. And so because we know for a fact that in in universe, this timer is going for an hour, but it's done at the end, like surprise, surprise, it they they she defuses it like at the last second or the last three seconds or something like that. So we know that in universe an hour has passed, despite the fact that it's only been like ten minutes of screen time. And so this does, like, this does kind of help me out because it's solid evidence that, like, yeah, all that stuff that seems like it should be taking a really long time does, in fact, take a really long time. You're right. Just normally we don't have a countdown. Right. It opens up a whole bunch of new questions, which is, like, this monster has been rampaging. You summoned the O-Robos. In this episode, we see that that took about 25 minutes. What were you doing in not? That meantime, we don't know, but at least we do know that things are taking more time. So anyways, Momo jumps in. She's got this time bomb missile, and it's going to go off in an hour. Right. And the Rangers I, I are do like, like that Momo is our promise. demolitions expert here. Yeah, they've okay. never mentioned anything like that. And I, again, I kind of like it. Now she have... proves to be very bad at it. You don't know how complicated this missile is. Maybe this is an extraordinary... It was built by machines, Matt. This could be an extraordinarily complicated missile. The only thing I don't love about the fact that Momo is doing it is that it just... It's more character stuff for Momo. Like, oh, Momo is the demolitions expert. That's not a thing that we knew before. Like, you could have used anybody. Like, give us a little more information. Like, we already have a lot of information about Momo. I'd like to know a little bit more about, I don't know, Shohei or something. I don't know, man. At this point, this is kind of the Momo show. And so if they're going to do it, they may as well go all in. Yeah, well, okay. That's actually a very good point. Um, so they're like, listen, we promise we will save your daughter. Which Don't don't make that promise, Rangers. Just say you're going to do your best. Don't promise anything. Like, we promise we're going to save out. your daughter. Like, we will, we will take care of it. And then, Bomb of the Great attacks. Yes. He shows up. He is a missile. Uh, he blows people up. 
Uh, he sort of flies around for a while. Um, and then he, he goes in and he tells them, like, what his deal is. So, yeah. Bomber the Great had previously, like, years and years Hold ago... Up, Matt, 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 let me stop you. Uh, Matt, could you please tell us his title? He is Bomber the Great. You know, Dave, it's not in my notes. How did you miss this? He is Bomber the Great, colon, the lone wolf of the universe. <laughs> oh, I like this guy, Dave. Yeah, no, Bomber the Great already rules. So Bomber the Great, colon, the lone wolf, lone wolf of the universe. Of the yeah, universe years ago had tried to overthrow uh, Bacchus Wrath and like take yeah. control of the Baranoia Empire. He failed, but he managed to escape before he was executed. Yeah, and has presumably just been like lying in wait, waiting for something or someone to take out Bacchus Wrath so that he could step in, take over Baranoia, and then like through Baranoia rule the rest of the universe. Yeah, and he he waited ten minutes before like rolling in, like as hey, soon as Bacchus Wrath was like, you have to assume he was already on the moon, just sort of like hiding behind a rock, just like uh, oh man, I'm actually, any you know day what? now. I'm going to assume I'm going to assume that he was hiding in the missile silos. I feel like that makes the most sense. That would have been very good. Yeah. So now we then so he kind of like goes into this thing. And then Bara Mammoth attacks. And Bara Mammoth has a very, very good look. He is just a giant, robotic, anthropomorphic uh, mammoth. He's carrying this giant banner that yeah. says, um, like, Bomber the Great for life. And also, Acha and Kocha are riding on top of Bara Mammoth's head. And they are also shouting, um, Bomber the Great for life. Now, Empress Hysteria and Prince Bulldont are sort of hiding behind some trees. Uh, yeah. next to and where are, uh, Bomber the Great and the O-Rangers are talking. Yeah, they are furious at this betrayal. They're like, Anja and Kocha have already abandoned us to join up with Bomber the Great. Like, how dare they, you how monsters? Dare they? Uh, and then Bomber the Great sort of like fronts on Bulldone and Empress Hysteria. He's just like, who are you even talking to? Like, no one cares about you anymore. And then he turns into a missile again and explodes them. Mm -hmm. uh, like, they don't die, but he does explode them. And then we see, uh, we pop back to the missile and we see that half an hour has passed. So half of our time is gone already. Yeah, that is, man, that has been a quick 30 minutes. Yeah, it was super, super fast. Uh, oh, by the way, so, at, at some point in here, Bomber the Great does tell, uh, tells Barrow Mammoth to attack them with his missile. Um, and he just, and then Barrow Mammoth just shoots a laser out of his face. Which is strange because so far what we have discovered in this episode is that Bomber the Great is a missile, but then the missile that he launched is a terrible missile, and then when he tells someone else to fire their missile, it's actually just a laser. And I don't... It feels strange to say this about uh, Bomber the Great. Does he know what missiles are and what they are supposed to do? Maybe he's too close to it. Maybe he just only, maybe he's like a Pokemon, like he only has one word for attack and it's missile. Okay. You know what I mean? Well, I can do like, that. shoot your missile at them and by missile he means laser. Right, like Bacchus um, Wrath was always talking about how surrender wasn't like programmed in, into his vocabulary. Uh, maybe Bomber the Great just only had like 20 words programmed into his vocabulary and seven of them were missile. Yeah, like he's just doing the best with what, he's like an Eskimo, you know what I mean? Like they've got... 550 different words for snow he's got yeah. one word for everything and it's just missile so <laughs> so um they activate the blocker robos so uh, the blocker robos are fighting bear mammoth and this is actually this is a really cool fight because it's not just a just a fight because first of all momo is not there piloting pink blocker because she's trying to disarm this missile and it's a it's like an escort mission they're not actually I mean, I guess they're trying to destroy Barra Mammoth, but primarily what they're trying to do is protect this van. And Barra Mammoth, Barra Mammoth isn't interested in destroying them. He just wants to get at this van. Yeah. Now, like, here's, here's another thing that is upsetting, is that the van gets picked up and is like being jostled around as oh, uh, the yellow blocker is just carrying it through this fight. Um, and none of this motion explodes the warhead but yet this girl is still trapped and cannot move the thing inside it's like 
any motion inside the car will cause it to explode. Literally anything that happens to the car itself does not matter. At some point, O-Blocker gets shot in the back by, like, a mammoth tusk missile. Yeah, it's cool. She, she goes flying. The van flies out of her hand. Red Blocker does, like, a flying catch and catches it, like, right before it hits the ground. None of this causes the missile to explode. Yeah, what... I was about to like go into that's basically what happens like there's a big fight and that is that's what's going on. The only thing that I do want to throw in there is they're fighting for like 5 minutes before Goro turns to Yellow Blogger and says like, "Hey, just run." And I thought it was very weird that it took him that long to be like, "Just get them just leave. Just get them out of here instead of like standing here and trying to keep me between you and Bara Mammoth." And then yeah. yeah, like she runs and he shoots because like uh, Baron Mammoth only has like one hand and then his other hand is like a big tusk that he uses as a weapon, but also apparently can fire as a missile. So that's rad. Uh, and then, yeah, like Yellow Blocker runs and gets shot in the back. And as you said, so we go from there, we get a quick shot that all of the robots, the Baronoi robots that is, are back on the moon already. Like Bomber the Great is settling into the throne He is watching this whole thing on TV. He's like, I'm going to watch this in style and comfort as my awesome robot destroys the O-Rangers. And then Hysteria and Bulldone are just kind of like off in a corner. Like they're kind of like spying a little bit. And Bulldone is like, oh, we're going to kill him. And Hysteria says like, actually, let's see if he can kill the O-Rangers first. Because if he can kill the O-Rangers first, that would be great. And then we'll kill him and take our revenge. Yeah, I I do like also in this scene, Acha and Kocha are like, polishing the uh like the missile body of bomber the great like ooh, you gotta Are look oh, you gotta that. look like That's nice great. and fancy <laughs> so um yeah so like i said baron mammoth hits uh robo blocker momo goes down or red blocker sorry momo goes down because like she gets shaken up inside the car and Red Blocker's like, well, there's nowhere left to run. So he just sort of puts the car down behind him and is just physically, like, this is a really cool, like, Baron Mammoth is just charging, kind of, and is, like, sort of, uh, sort of, like a, like a, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a rugby scrum. Like, they're, like, locked in and pushing okay, yeah. each other, trying to get at this, and he's trying to get at this car, and, and Red Blocker is he's blocking him. So that is great. Um... As you said, Rumi. Yeah, Momo is unconscious, but Rumi yeah. has woken up. Rumi wakes her up. Uh, Rumi has woken up, and then she wakes up Momo and says, like, hey, like, you've got to, like, I don't know what to do with this bomb. And she, like, kind of pulls a napkin out and, like, binds her wound up and is like, you can do it, Momo. Like, come on. And there's three minutes left on the timer. And Momo at this point is seemingly just cutting wires at random. Like she cuts a wire at the seven minute mark and is kind of surprised when it doesn't stop the bomb. And then she cuts another one around five minutes uh, and then another one at three minutes. And every time it's like, all right, here we go. And then the timer keeps going and she just looks more and more worried. Yeah. And she's just like, it's really weird because like they're clearly trying to, to snag the beats from a like high tension bomb diffusing scene, but they are interspersing it with giant robot fighting a giant robot mammoth. And also they haven't done any establishing work on like what's going on with this bomb. Right. And they made the timer way too long. So the only way you can make it work is to like keep doing jump cuts to 10 minutes later and then have Momo be knocked out for part of it so that really she only has like those last five minutes. Yeah, so she's like looking at this last little portion. She can't figure out what wire to cut. Like, which one? 30 seconds. Which one? 20 seconds. And then they start doing a countdown like 10, 9, 8. Now, and they I, get to by three the way, as, seconds. as this is happening, at this point, O Blocker is kind of like down on the ground, but like above the van and Barra Mammoth is trying to literally just push O Blocker into the van to crush it. Yeah, it's like I said, it's a as robot fights go, it's pretty dramatic. Like we don't normally normally there's a lot of like hitting with swords and shooting and stuff, but just like these two giant creatures like 
grappling with each other. Um, it's pretty good. They really sell it. It's very good. Yeah. Uh, you don't get to see. And they also did a really good job of establishing the giantness of them. Like a lot of the time you sort of, I at least don't think about the fact that like, oh yeah, the robots are supposed to be super, super giant. Like, because they're often just fighting other creatures that are the same size as them. Yeah, right? it's always nice when they do some extra establishing work to really give you the scale. Yeah, so, like, you really get a sense for, like, the titanic forces that are that are in play here. Um, this is really cool. So, so, finally, there's, like, three seconds left. Momo can't figure out a wire to cut. And she just, she just unplugs it. Like, the wires are all plugged into a little socket, and she just pulls it out of the socket. And that's what she had to do the whole time. It's like a... It's like a serial port where you'd like plug your monitor into your desktop tower. Yeah. And it turns out the answer was just unplug all of them. Uh, so that works. So the bomb is now um, disarmed. Momo is Are able... Are we just going to escape by the fact that that's why, that's how that worked? Like, I'm cool with that, but we don't want to address that. I mean... Just don't want to address that one at all. I mean, what, what do you want to say, Dave? <laughs> you know... You what, I mean, right. what do you I got? Know. I just... I, I, I have it in my notes um, that she's just kind of doing things at random, and then eventually she just wins, and it's fine. Yeah, no, it's good. It's she good. spent a luck point, whatever. Um, so anyways, so the other blockers show up all of a sudden, and then Momo Henshin's, and so now it's really like, they form O, they all combine, they form O blocker, and now it's like O blocker versus Bar Mammoth. Uh, I do want to say, I don't think we mentioned this before, I really dig. First of all, O Blocker has a cool look. I think he's actually got a lot cooler look than um, O Robo. Yeah, I think you may have said that last week. Uh, so, anyways, O Blocker, I really dig. Did I mention last week how much I dig how he gets his swords? Uh, I don't think so. He just like holds out his fists, and then there's like a bunch of like laser flashes in a line around his fist, and then they coalesce into. He has twin swords, which I also really dig. I think it's really neat that he has two because normally it's like one big one. So I like that a lot. Uh, And then his finishing move is he like slaps both swords together and then they turn into a giant lightsaber claymore, like a light claymore, I guess. Yeah. And he just sort of like swings it down slash like it extends and then he cuts Bear Man with a half. It it rules. (laughs) Yeah, it's very good. They don't spend as much time like lovingly showing you blowing like with this thing blowing up as they did last week with uh, Bacchus Wrath exploding, but that was a little more significant. Yeah, that's a big thing. The, and then the thing, I do the thing I want to mention about Barra Mammoth exploding. Yeah, can we talk about this for a second? Is that his okay. Do you remember like a, a month or two ago when Elon Musk laid off all those people? And then, like, the people that he laid off were on Twitter, like, oh, man, Elon, I'm sorry you had to fire me. I totally get that you need to make sacrifices. We're all still rooting for you. I'm sorry I couldn't help you any more than I did, even though he had just fired them and they were now unemployed. Like, yeah. that is what Baramathith is like here. He is in mid-explosion saying that he still supports Bomber the Great and wishes that he, he says, could have given him more help. He says, I quote, he says, I'm sorry I wasn't more useful. Bomber the Great for life. It's a weird stance. Um, it's a little <laughs> weird, but you have to admire that level of dedication. I guess, sure. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it was very, um, I, I, I like Barra Mammoth. I wish... He, I don't think he's going to do super well in the creature royale because no, because he's just well, yeah, we'll get we'll well we'll get there when we get there. Yeah, um, but I wish they would have gotten have more a... of him because I think that he had the potential to be very cool. And then uh, we see uh, we have a final scene where Bomber the Great is just super pissed that his monster has lost, and he decapitates Acha and Kocha for their failures. Yeah, I don't know if that means that they are dead forever or if they're. Man, I don't know. I hope so. I hope. I hope Bomber the Great is just like, nope, I destroyed you, and that's that. Uh, and actually, we do get a quick shot of Hysteria, and she's like, yeah, serves that right. Yeah. She, she's glad that they're destroyed, which I liked. Uh, anyway, so, uh, Dave, speaking of the Creature Royale, um, it is the end of the episode of O-Ranger, of course, but not the end of our episode, because we need to figure out where Barra Mammoth fits in the Creature Royale. Yeah, so... 
you know, I, I first I had, was inclined to be like, well, we do have one other mammoth monster. That's space time mammoth. He's at slot, sl- slot number six, and there's just no way that Baron Mammoth is going to be even close to there. So I feel like we should look for someone who had the potential to be cool, who had a very cool look, but did not actually end up end up doing very much. Okay, Dave, I, I think I have a good starting point. So okay, let's look at number ninety eight on the list, Semimaru. Oh, so, okay. So Semimaru, if you don't remember, is from Jetman, and he was he was basically just like a big monster that uh, Radigat I think created. Is that right? Uh, Radigat grew him from a like caterpillar, basically. That's right. Um, and that and I want to of- say. Um, the, the Empress, whatever her name was. Yuza, I want to say. Yeah, like she came down and I think she took control of Semimaru for a while. Semimaru was like a big, cool looking monster. Didn't really have a character, but was used as sort of like the big threat of a new villain, or at least of a new stage of the show starting. And I think that yeah. that's roughly equivalent to what we're looking at here with Baron Mammoth. Yeah, and... And again, like Simi Mara, he he took a little bit longer to go down, but not not like a whole lot longer, if yeah. I recall correctly. Now, so yeah, I think that's actually that is that's a really good spot. Now I think that uh, Barra Mammoth looks cooler than Simi Mara, but Simi Mara did have the benefit of having like that five episode lead up to like him growing into that giant monster form. Yeah, um, you know what? Actually, let me let me pop down a few spots because I remember Tengu from Kaku Ranger. I think he's actually a very similar character. Like he had a really cool look. He was supposed to, I felt like he was going to herald a much bigger thing and he, and he kind of didn't. Um, yeah. It turns out the Tengu was not coming back, but that, um, Oh, what was his name? The mad scientist. Like he was Dr. the main. K- Kagami. Was that it? You know, the guy who made everybody the, the, cyborg. Yeah, the cyborg guy. Dr. The drill Dr. Hand Dr. cyborg guy. Dr. Yagami. Yagami. That Turns was out that. Dr. Yagami was the big deal from that episode. We just didn't realize it. Yeah. So I am going to say, I would say that I, I don't like, I, I think we should go a little bit further down for Bara Mammoth. Um, okay. Uh, how do we know, feel about him as either better or worse than Thunder from Dire Ranger? You know, I, I might say that I, I like him better than Thunder. I'll say that. Okay. Yeah. He definitely um, has more personality than Thunder. Yeah. I might even go one up, uh, one up from Barra Missler. I don't like him as much as I like Barra Boxer. I think Barra Boxer just had like such a cool look, such a wild thing going on. Okay. Um, so do we want to put would, him between yeah. Barra Boxer and Barra Missler? Yeah, that uh, that works for me. So it's lot one hundred and seven. Barra Mammoth. All right. Well, Dave, that's going to do it for another episode of Free Horizon Ranger. Before we finish up here, I'd like to remind you all that you can email the show at supersentaibrothers at gmail.com. If you want to get any updates on future episodes or check out the things that we're talking about on Twitter, we are on there at supersentaibros. If you like the show, and I hope that you do, please remember that shining in the iTunes review section, there are five stars. Rate, review, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you get the show. That is what's going to help new people find it and will also make us feel good. Um, if you would like to listen to any of the other great Retrograde Orbit Radio shows, you can find them all at RetrogradeOrbitRadio.com. Uh, once again, we are the Super Sentai Brothers. I'm Matt. I'm Dave. And we'll see you next week for the greatest show on Earth. <laughs>